So uh, one silicon wafer is used to make hundreds of chips. And so on here, you can kind of see uh, little sections. So one, one wafer will have hundreds and hundreds of chips, but they kind of print them here, 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 and they'll go across this wafer until they've got them all printed. And we'll, sh we'll see that in the video. Um, and later on, they'll cut that apart, and that's what makes your, your individual um, computer chips. But you guys can pass those around. Here's a good example. So um, on that big wafer, there'll be you know lots and lots of these repeats. So each one of these will get later cut out and made into your, your computer chip, your Intel inside, or whatever it is that they have. Um, but we have a couple different parts here. Here's the photo mask. Uh, the mask is usually a piece of glass or quartz that has um, a, a transparent area and a non-transparent area that they make with chrome or something that the light can't go through. So um, a couple of different exposure methods or different types of illumination systems used today. Uh, first is contact. And so contact is exactly what it is. Um, we have the light source and we have some optical systems, okay? And then the mask. And the mask is actually in contact with the photoresist. And so um, kind of where the industry went after that, okay, uh, we don't want to touch the resist. Imagine if you're touching this resist, you move to another wafer, you touch another resist, there's contamination, you're getting chemical left over on that mask. It's not the best way. So at some point they switched to having some sort of gap here. You know, back in 1980s, this was okay, but now we need to make something that's a lot faster. So there's a different way to do that. Um, and so we use projection. So this is almost like a standard microscope. Uh, or you know something that is more advanced. Um, and so projection, we have our light source here, and then some of our optics, lenses, different things to kind of capture, you know, do what we want with the light. Here's our mask, um, so it's in there. And then we have another set of lenses to help with the reduction. And so um, the wafer and the photoresist is far away from the mask and usually far away from the light source. And so there's advantages to this. The biggest one is that we can get very small. Um, depending on you know, the optics and the physics of what you're doing, you can do a lot of stuff with this. Um, and this is the only way right now to get to where we need with the integrated circuits that we use today. We have a couple different sources of light <laughs> many years ago. Um, we had something called blue, which is still in the visible. This is um, kind of industry term called G-line. The wavelength of light we used was 4. 136 nanometers, and it used the mercury bulb. Um, and then, you know, sometime kind of in the late uh, 70s, early 80s, we also switched to eye line, which is 365 nanometers. So the wavelength of light has gotten a little shorter. Um, so we can get some features that are smaller, um, and this feature size is the width that we use. So you could get around 220 nanometers with eye line, um, and we're still light bulb. Um, but as the need for even smaller became evident in the 1980s-ish, um, traditional mercury lamps just couldn't meet the need. So we needed to go to shorter, shorter wavelengths. Um, and so that's when ultraviolet eczema lasers were introduced. Um, I'm sure you guys have all seen lasers, right? Um, so these lasers use a mixture of gases that normally don't combine. So noble gases don't like to react with them. Let's go ahead and put them in a laser and see what happens. So however, when, um, when enough energy is applied, Atoms of the two gases join together um, to form excited temporary uh, molecules. These are called excimers. Um, and so the excited molecules release excess energy, which, you know, um, whichever, you know, light that they release, that the wavelength of light depends on the gases. Um, but that's what we use to, to um, uh, image things right now. So the first of these, these excimer lasers was a krypton fluoride laser. Uh, this one has output at 248 nanometers. Um, we call that DUV. Uh, and so that one was able to get to an 80 nanometer feature size. Okay, that's great. Um, wonderful mid 90s, uh, 1990s for you young people uh, <laughs> was where that was kind of introduced. Um, but we needed to go smaller. And so the next one iteration here was an argon fluoride. Uh, and this was at 193 nanometers is the wavelength that it has output at. Uh, that could get us to 38 nanometers um, feature size. Um, and so that's kind of where the industry is right now with EUV. But EUV, 13.5 uh, nanometers is the wavelength that we use. Um, we've moved on from lasers, and now we use a tin plasma. Uh, that is what they use to generate that wavelength of light. It's no longer, no longer behaves the same, and there's a lot more complicated things going on with it. 
um, which we'll kind of see next. 